Hello, AP Psych. You have made it through another unit. This is the end of unit four. This is lecture number six. It is social learning. Um, it is okay to call this observational learning. I just think you're better off thinking of it as social learning because it's based around something called social learning theory. So both are acceptable, both are correct. I just think it's a little bit, it'll stick with you a little bit better if you think of it as social learning. But all social learning happens through observation. So observe me teaching you something right now and um, maybe you'll learn something. All right, here we go. Here are learning targets. Okay, social learning theory. What is this theory? It is the idea that higher thinking animals, especially humans, learn through observing and imitating others. If you think of the phrase, um, I want to live vicariously through someone, it's almost like I want to pretend to have someone else's life so I could feel like what it might be like. Um, vicarious learning is the same thing. You are learning through someone else's experience. Uh, we tend to call these someone else's models when we're talking in terms of learning. So someone else is modeling whether on purpose or not and someone else is observing and learning through them. Um, we see a little graphic here of the monkeys and the monkeys on the, the monkey on the right imitates the monkey on the left in touching the pictures in a certain order to get a reward. So if the first monkey goes to picture one, five, three, nine, and food comes out, um, then the next monkey is going to follow the same pattern, hoping that they will also get uh, reinforced in the same way. So who thought of this social learning theory? None other than our final big kahuna of the learning uh, psychologist, and that is Albert Bandura. Uh, and he believed that observational learning occurred in four stages. You could say steps, stages, either one. Um, he believed that those were attention, retention, reproduction, and motivation. So first, um, someone has to be paying attention to somebody else's behaviors and the consequences, the rewards, the reinforcements and punishments that follow those behaviors. Then if that person who was paying attention can retain and remember that sequence of events, then they are more likely to be able to think it through and consider whether or not it's something that they want to reproduce or imitate, which is our next stage. And then they might determine whether they can or can't do that, but ultimately, they need to determine if they have the motivation, if they're actually interested in learning that behavior, copying that behavior, and then carrying it out. Please note, I'm gonna have two of these in this lecture. This, this whole process is also a signal of cognition. So behavior here, unlike with classical and operant conditioning, is not shaped by immediate consequences. So there's no bell for salivation. There's no um, immediate reward for observing someone or punishment for observing someone. Through true social learning, that person who just did the observing has to take some time or some cognition moments um, to consider the implication of the actions of what they just saw, of what the behavior was, and of the reinforcement or punishment that followed to decide if this is something they want to reproduce and if it is something they're motivated, um, if there are consequences that they're motivated to get as well to get or avoid, depending. Bandura discovered or formed this theory through his Bobo doll experiment. This was conducted in 1961, and a bunch of children uh, learned through imitating others who received re rewards and punishments. So that's, I kind of jumped ahead, that's the conclusion. But what happened was that kids watched adults beat up this Bobo doll. It's like a, it's like a boxing doll. I'll show you a video at some point. Um, but it's, you know, you can punch it and it's got sand in the bottom. And so it bounces down and comes right back. And so you can punch it again. And kids watched adults act aggressively towards this doll, like for the experiment, for show. Um, and then they were, the adults were rewarded for it. So what did the kids do when they got their chance around the Bobo doll? They too acted aggressively, sometimes even taking that aggression even further than the, the adults possibly hoping to get rewarded even more. The conclusions of social learning theory are far reaching and it boils down to the idea that um, what we see influences what we do and this can have positive or negative effects on society. Um, and so here we see a discussion of pro-social models. When we observe others uh, 
doing pro-social behaviors, things that benefit others, helping, sharing, donating, that sort of thing, it makes us more likely to do the same. So for example, um, why do we always have charity drives done in competitions between tacks? Because if you see one tack donating a lot, it might make you more tempted to do the same. Um, why is something like a GoFundMe so popular? When you hear that thousands or millions of other people are donating money or signing petitions, it's going to make you more likely to do the same. So of course, this is the sort of model we want to harness. We want to find um, people that are demonstrating pro-social behaviors so they're seen and emulated. But the same thing applies to antisocial models. Um, they demonstrate antisocial behaviors, which uh, might harm or at least show lack of consideration of others, and they too will be mimicked. So especially think of um, a family where they communicate through yelling or um, in a worst case scenario, when little kids are watching family members be abusive towards one another, they are likely to copy it, which is why we consider uh, those sorts of behaviors a cycle of abuse that it's hard to break that cycle when um, younger people are observing it, they're more likely to imitate it. Uh, at the, sa the same could go on a regular society when you see people um, being disruptive over something like wearing a mask or following some other policy in a store or restaurant um, and getting away with it and maybe not having consequences that look too severe, it means that other people will do the same thing. Altogether, this is why your behavior in front of young children matters. It's why what you post on social media matters. It's why the behavior of celebrities and politicians and other public figures matter. As much as we want to say that those people maybe shouldn't be our role models, they are. When we observe uh, uh, people on social media or media of any kind acting a certain way, better or worse, there are people in society that are gonna learn from those behaviors. One more example to drive this point home. It was found in a study in 2004 that elementary children who were exposed to violent tele television videos and video games expressed increased um, aggression. Now this was a correlational study, not an experiment. So we can't say for sure the cause and effect relationship here, but most experts do agree that watching high levels of media violence makes viewers more susceptible to acting aggressively. In fact, um, in this same study, it was found that between the ages of 5 and 15, the average child will witness at least 13,000 violent deaths on TV. So it's got to lead you to think about um, that, the, the effects of that on the children observing them. So what are the implications of observation in general, um, no matter whether it's pro-social, anti-social, or anything else? We have found, or psychologists have found, that we as humans are more likely to imitate those who we perceive as similar to us, um, those who are successful and admirable, um, people whose behaviors are reinforced rather than punished. We are more likely to copy uh, people or mimic people who are rewarded, um, and we are more likely to imitate those whose actions and words are consistent. So when someone, uh, perhaps a public figure, claims that they are going to do X, Y, Z, and then follows through, we're more likely to copy that person than someone who makes a promise that doesn't, and they don't follow through with it. One more cognition alert for you. Um, we are also more likely influenced by what we believe will happen than by actual experience. So this is actually a flawed um, a, a piece of cognition, I guess. Um, let's take sports athletes for a second. If we see someone like LeBron um, practicing um, to a certain extent or following a certain diet or following a certain regimen, we might do the same thing believing it's going to help us find success, even if we have a cognition or we have a thought process deep, deep down that tells us, yeah, but the likelihood of us being the greatest superstar in basketball history is still really, really slim. But this doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I mean, watching an Olympian work hard and train hard um, might motivate you to work hard and train hard in your own sport or field. And so that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. But it does mean that sometimes we maybe have more grand expectations through our observations than what we are experiencing in reality. So there are two other ways that we address um, our behaviors or try to change our, learn to change our behaviors that I need to address that sort of fit here and are sort of just tacked on because it's the end of the unit. So we'll see how I do in explaining them in connection to social learning theory. But 
Um, behavior modification is the first one. And these are typically programs where we use operant conditioning principles to modify maladaptive or unwanted behaviors. This could happen in a classroom setting, it could happen in, in a therapy setting, um, but uh, one specific example is rehabilitation uh, programs in prisons. And so this is where um, the, probably the, the psychologists working with prisoners are trying to desocialize certain bad behaviors and then re-socialize the prisoners and replace their behaviors with socially acceptable behaviors so they can fit into society successfully. So perhaps you can earn time, um, early time off of your prison sentence or certain privileges in prison for making good choices. So that would be an example of a behavior modification program. And then finally, biofeedback is not so much social learning, but it's more observing yourself um, to be able to make behavior modifications. And so biofeedback is the process of gaining awareness of bodily functions with a goal of being able to manipulate them at will. So in other words, think of it like um, self-awareness. When you feel specifically to your body, um, when you feel your heart rate pumping as you react to stress, if you recognize that it's happening and you are aware that it's happening, you might be able to pause, take a few deep breaths to reduce it and then reapproach the situation. Um, this can be done with tools like Fitbits or other heart rate monitors, but it doesn't have to. It's more just observing your own bodily behaviors and, and trends and patterns and then working, consciously working to adjust them as needed.